Um, and there's lots of examples of this, which is you know, even just the fact that fundamentally climate change demands that we consume less, right? At its core, we have to shop less. Now, this is coming at the moment of you know, the triumphant moment of shopping, where shopping is about creating your identity, right? And this is what my first book was about, is that you know, the, the whole triumph of branding was you know, not just about buying things. It was, it was about when all of these other ways of creating self and creating community are failing. Shopping is all that's left. So when, when you tell people you're going to have to shop less, you're not just telling them that, that, that they're not going to have specific things that they want. It's seen as an attack on their identity. You, you, and we have to understand this, what it means to organize in the neoliberal era. Um, the other thing is that you know, climate change plays out in an intensely local way, in intensely local landscapes. It's an, it, an early blooming of a particular flower, an unusually thin layer of ice on a lake, a late arrival of a migratory bird. bird. And noticing these things, these kinds of subtle changes, requires an intimate connection with a specific ecosystem. And that kind of communion only happens when we know a place deeply, not just a scenery, but also a sustenance and when local knowledge is passed on with a sense of sacred trust from one generation to the next. Knowledge of that sort, as you all know, is increasingly rare. That is also a legacy of the success, the triumph of the capitalist project. Certainly in urbanized, the urbanized, industrialized world, we tend to leave our homes lightly for a new job, for a new school, for a new love. And as we do so, we're severed from whatever knowledge of place we manage to communicate at the previous stop, as well as from the knowledge amassed by our ancestors, who very likely are, were migrants themselves. So it takes something huge, you know, like a Frankenstorm, to get people's attention. Um, so this is part of what we're dealing with. Now, as I lay this out, I, you know, I, I, I realize that this can be scary and dispiriting to talk about these deeper, these, the, the, these deeper barriers to dealing with the climate crisis, and it can make it can make people feel hopeless, because it means that climate change can't be pried apart from the other major challenges that we face, whether social, political, economic, or spiritual. But here's the really good news: more and more of us are longing for precisely that kind of deep structural change. As the multiple popular uprisings of recent years have shown, millions around the wor world are forging new ways of doing politics, one that do not just make demands of external forces, but also rebuild, trade communities, and help participants to find more humane ways to relate to each other. That was the magic of Occupy Wall Street, of Spain's <laughs> indignados and the encampments in Tahrir Square, or of the Quebec student movement. And it lives on in countless uh, new movements and experiments and projects. These movements are rebuilding relationships, rebuilding community, and that's crucial in, in, in meeting the climate challenge. Now, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to sort of jump ahead here. Um, the idea that the solutions to the climate change must be socially and spiritually rewarding in their own right, regardless of their carbon impacts, is central to the success of our meeting this crisis. Because never before have we faced a crisis with such long time lags. It's not like you're going to do something, you're going to cut your carbon footprint and you're going to feel the effects tomorrow. No, we know that we have to live with the effects of the carbon we've already emitted. Um, this is precisely why so many environmentalists say they're taking action not for themselves, but for their children and grandchildren. And as a new mother, I can understand that impulse to say we need to do it for our kids. But I really think that's not good enough. In societies facing as many simultaneous crises as ours, the vast majority will only ever embrace radical change to the way they consume and produce if those changes bring tangible benefits now. And by that I mean greater health, um, stronger communities, less inequality, less oppression, more fulfilling work, a sense of collective purpose. In other words, we, we can't say this is just for tomorrow. There have to be rewards that come now, and that is the real benefit of weaving together, knitting together the movements for economic justice and climate justice. Now, making this political shift is urgent. So long as tackling climate change is seen as some sort of benevolent gift to future generations, the ground will be fertile for corporations and their political surrogates to cast environmental action as some sort of theft from suffering families in the here and now. And we just saw this you know, most spectacularly from Mitt Romney during 
the, the Republican convention where he said President Obama promised to slow the rise of the oceans and heal the planet, big laugh. I promise to help you and your family. You know? And that was a terrifying moment because it really does show the appeal of that argument. Um, and even if it doesn't get him the presidency, what we're seeing is that precisely that pitting of the environment versus the economy is working. It's, it's, it's being used by the Canadian government, it's being used by European governments, and they're rolling back whatever meager climate commitments they had made. Um, the bottom line is this, not until we have a plan to heal the planet that also heals our broken selves and our broken communities do we have a hope of preventing this most dire of all crises. And our job is to begin to imagine quickly what that holistic healing process might look like. So just finishing up here, some of you know that, that my last book, The Shock Doctrine, was about how the right, um, how, how elites, use crises to push through policies that enrich the 1%, um, that have nothing to do with the crisis themselves, that have nothing to do with actually fixing the problem that created the crisis, but just using disorientation, fear, um, to, to ramp through their wish list of, of, of policies. And I think that's very relevant here, because climate change is a very big crisis indeed, the biggest one we've ever faced, and it is not immune from these types of tactics. Um, disaster capitalism is alive and well, uh, from carbon markets to geoengineering to the patenting of so-called climate-ready GMO seeds, massive land grabs in Asia and Africa and Latin America. Meanwhile, countries racked by climate-related natural disasters find much-needed aid tied to demands that they privatize their assets and give sweetheart deals to investors, which is precisely the sort of stuff that I, I describe in the shock doctrine. In other words, disaster capitalism is happening. It will continue to happen in the context of the climate crisis. The real question is, can we respond to this crisis with something else, with another kind of agenda? And there is a precedent for this, because the left has seized on moments of crisis, of dislocation, to move populist agendas, not in the way the right does, um, by steamrolling over democracy and, 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 and taking advantage of people's panic, but by actually building mass popular movements uh, in those moments. And, and you know, the best example is obviously after the Great Depression, when the rage at elites after the market crash fueled the demand for a social safety net. And after World War II, when wartime sacrifices galvanized returning veterans to demand a share of the prosperities, and a few of the leg legacies uh, though embattled as they are, of these exceptional moments include public health care, uh, old age pensions, subsidized housing, and public funding for the arts. I believe that climate change represents such a, a historic opportunity, a chance to usher in progressive change, what I've come to think of as the people's shock. We once again have a chance to advance the kind of policies that dramatically improve lives to close the gap between rich and poor, and reinvigorate democracy from the bottom up. But in a way, it's a race against time. Either this crisis will become an opportunity for an evolutionary leap, a holistic readjustment of our relationship with the natural world, or it will become an opportunity for the biggest disaster capitalism free for all in human history, leaving the world ever more brutally cleaved between winners and losers, with storms raging outside the gilded gates of privatized communities. The good news is that if we recognize the potential of this moment, we have the chance to avoid that fate. When I wrote The Shock Doctrine, I was documenting past crimes. This is a crime in progress. It is within our power to stop it. As we inevitably change in the face of crisis, and we will, let's make sure the good guys win this time. Thank you.